Thank you. All right, let's proceed. <laughs> Thank you, Chief Justice Ireland. Associate Justices, may it please the court. My name is Greg Parks. With me here is John McGivney. Together, we represent Toys R Us. This wrongful death products liability action resulted in a $20 million judgment against Toys R Us. $18 million of that is an account of punitive damages. That judgment should be reversed for a number of reasons that are set forth in our briefs. I'm happy to address any of those reasons, but I want to focus my remarks here today on three. First, that judgment was founded on an inapplicable regulation such that it should be reversed in its entirety. Oh. Second, okay. um, there was insufficient evidence of gross negligence such that no punitive damages should have been allowed. And third, the amount of punitive damages imposed here was excessive, particularly in light of an inappropriate closing argument. Recognizing that we're here on uh, direct appellate review and that the court has solicited amicus briefs on that third point, <coughs> we're going to try to get there quickly, but I want to start with the first two with the court's indulgence. First, at the core of plaintiff's case here was 16 CFR 1207. That's a regulation that applies to swimming pool slides. That is a defined term in the regulation, and it's defined at 1207.3A28 as any device used to enter a swimming pool by sliding down an inclined plane. What? A plane, of course, is a flat surface. An inclined plane is one that tilts down. There, there's, I mean, yes, but how are, there seems to be enormous disagreement between you with respect to what, what your position was at trial. And certainly the representation by the plaintiffs is that in a whole number of ways, you indicated that, yes, you agreed that um, 1207 applied, um, but except for certain pieces of it didn't, but that it generally did. Is that not so? That is not so, Justice Botsford. At, at trial and in, in response to a motion from the plaintiffs that 1207 did apply and that Toys R Us should not be allowed to argue to the contrary, um, Toys R Us's trial counsel at A1739 said very clearly 1207 does not apply. He said it applies to rigid slides. This doesn't meet that. He said it doesn't, a lot of the performance standards don't make sense. So yes, Your Honor, um, that portion of the presentation certainly was something that Toys R Us said at When trial. did he say that? Uh, at A1739. No, no, no. Wait, wait. What point in time in the trial did he say that? While motions in limine were being considered. Okay. So did, did long he, before. At the time that, that Section 1207 was offered into evidence, I take it in printed form, was there an objection? There was an objection then as well. There was an objection or a discussion in motions in limine where... If, if I go to that page, am I going to see the word, I object? Um, at that point, we are still on motions in limine, Justice Spina. So, at the time it was offered in evidence, uh, no, because at that point, at the, the time it was offered in evidence, if I go to the transcript, will I see the words, Your Honor, I object? No, Justice Spina, because okay. at that point the court had already ruled, and the court, on the very first day of trial, shortly after opening statements, read a statement to the jury. Um, and did so at A2055. This was before 1207 was offered into evidence, before that time that Your Honor is, is indicating. Yeah. At but, that but point... What do you say about the mass guide to evidence, Section 103A3, which says that a, um, a ruling on a motion, to pres a motion in limine does not preserve an objection? Uh, Your Honor, I'd point to Justice Ireland's uh, opinion, uh, opinion in Rotkeys, which says that the... the standard of preserving an issue is, is it clearly presented to the court as a matter of law? Is the party's position articulated such that the judge knows that the judge is ruling on that issue? And in, in Rotkeys, this court said, that's all that's required. And although, yes, it certainly would have been ideal and a best practice to object at the time it was offered into evidence and to object at the time of the jury instruction. Did the judge, but, hear, did the judge here say your rights are preserved? The judge didn't know, Justice Speaker, okay. did not, no but when, when we moved on post-trial motions and said 1207 doesn't apply, 
Justice, uh, the, the, the trial court judge did not say that issue um, wasn't preserved. The trial court judge says, I already ruled on that issue. Well, and in Rotkey's, that's all that's required to preserve the there issue. There was no objection to the jury instruction either. Is that right? That's correct, Justice Botsford. By that point, the issue had already been resolved against Toys R Us definitively, and Rotkey's and others um, have said that this court rejects the hard and fast rule of the First Circuit that says you need to make that objection at that time. It recognizes there are other ways to preserve that objection, what, and the, here those other ways were preserved. Did, did uh, counsel for Toys R Us, I mean, did, did you treat it as a jury question at that point? I mean, in other words, did counsel argue, you know, this regulation does, to the jury, this regulation doesn't apply? No, we were prohibited from arguing that to the jury because the plaintiffs had moved in limine for an order precluding Toys R Us from arguing that it didn't apply, and the court had granted that motion, and the court had ruled as a matter of law that 1207 did apply. And that ruling occurs, um, again, at uh, A2055. Now, let's, and, as, let's assume you get past the issue of the objection. Uh, what do you say with regard to 1207.1, subsection 2? The commission finds the types or classes of products that, that, that are subject to this standard or those swimming pool slides manufactured, constructed, or imported for use in connection with all swimming pools, whether in ground, on ground, or above ground, regardless of the materials of manufacture or structural characteristics of the slides. That's an extraordinarily broad scope. It is, Justice Gantz, but what's still there is the word swimming pool slide, which is what incorporates the defined term that I referenced earlier, which is there needs to be a plane. And here, there was no plane. There was no hard, flat surface. Instead, this product is designed to flex down. Swimming pool slides, when this uh, regulation was promulgated, were rigid structures. This was an inflatable structure. It was designed to be flexible. It's fabric filled with air. It's designed to flex down such that when a rider goes down it, it actually curves underneath the rider. It's not a plane. It's a curve that's underneath there. So, uh, but and that but without matters a, without a rider on it, it is a plane, isn't it? It's not. It actually bows upward. If you look at the pictures of it, it actually bows upward because there's air in, inside of it, and it's, it's kind of like a balloon. It takes a more rounded shape when it's... Uh, uh, when it's full of air. So the Con Consumer Product Safety Commission, since 1976, has just decided we don't care about these inflatable slides? I just find that incredible. Actually, we noted in your brief, Your Honor, that uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission is looking at a standard for constant air inflatable products, and they're looking at the ATA ASTM standard, and that's referenced in the Toy Industry Association brief to this court, where this the Toy Industry Association argues that this standard does not apply, and it references the fact that there is that ASTM standard. When you look at 1207, it's very clear that the performance tests were meant for rigid slides. They were not meant for a flexible slide like this. And it's also very clear from the record-making history or the, the, the regulatory history that the Consumer Product Safety Commission did not consider the risks of inflatable slides or the costs of imposing these tests on inflatable slides. Um, well, that's because there were not inflatable slides when it was enacted. That's correct, Justice but isn't that why, But isn't that why they basically said we're not going to worry about what materials are used? We're going to say it applies to all materials, whatever but it, may emerge over the course of time? It still needs to be a plane, which is a hard, <coughs> flat surface. And when you look at the tests, when you look at the fact that the 350-pound the test, that's a test where you put 350 pounds on the slide, you see if it deforms down. This slide is designed to deform down. You could see how with a rigid slide, that's a problem. If it deforms down, it's breaking. For an inflatable slide, that is not the case. Do, oh. do, does, a, uh, does a rigid slide have a lip at the end of it? Uh, it? It can, Your Honor. It can have a little curve at the top and a little curve at the bottom, such that, but it still has a part of it that is an inclined plane. But, a flat but do plane any of them not have a lip at the bottom? Um, it, it could, but actually it probably, if it didn't have a lip, it probably wouldn't pass the slide geometry test, which so, is the... Okay, so it wouldn't be a plane. Uh, it is a plane for at least for part, part of it. it. The, the main part of it is plane, and the entire structure is rigid. The entire structure is not Use the word flexible. rigid in the regulation? It does not. It uses the word plane, which is a flat, rigid surface, not... Well, it doesn't necessarily mean rigid. I, I just suggest plane doesn't necessarily mean rigid, does a, it? A plane is a flat surface, not designed flat, to but bend. But flat and rigid are two different things. That's, what uh, that's correct, Your, Justice Botsford, although... Um, at this time, all swimming pool slides that were in existence were rigid, and that's where the, the standards were met. Now, if, if the word plane were so important, would it not be defined? Because it's not. 
It is not, Your Honor, and, and, and there's no case law on that, and that's why we've, we've resorted to dictionary definitions of plane geometrically as a flat surface. If I may, I'd like to move to gross negligence. Um, this court has made it very clear that um, gross negligence is um, not just a lot of negligence. It is a higher order of magnitude of negligence. It is the want of scant care. It is the failure to do what even a careless person would. The core of plaintiff's gross negligence case was the same 1207 standard, and... Well, but Judge Whitehead, in his ruling, at least as I read it, said, I don't really need to reach that. I, it, 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 it reaches the reprehensible level without even talking about that standard. Uh, <clears throat> correct, Your Honor, although we would certainly disagree with that. I mean, for, first of all, on 1207, um, uh, there is no evidence that Toys R Us believed that, to, uh, that 1207 applied to this slide, knew that it applied to the slide. Um, what Toys R Us's corporate representative witnesses said at A2230 is they were aware of the standard, but not that they were aware that this standard applied to an inflatable product like this. And certainly a careless person could look at a product like this and conclude that 1207 did not apply. I would submit to you that a careful person just did. But um, going beyond that, um, what we have here is Toys R Us buying this product from a manufacturer or distributor, getting from that distributor a representation of three things. One, that it was safe for its intended purpose. Two, that it met all applicable requirements. And three, that it would be tested to all the requirements it needed to be tested to. Well, again, there seems to be a factual issue as to whether at the time that this purchase was made from Manly or whatever in China, um, that the testing of Toys R Us included that they would figure out what tests as opposed to being asked to test for particular uh, requirements. Yes, there was testimony. Toys R Us said that um, under their understanding, Bureau Veritas was supposed to test everything. I think the jury could have believed or disbelieved that particular testimony, but the jury could not have disbelieved the master purchase order agreement that Toys R Us had with the distributor, which said it would be tested to all required tests. And then, pursuant to that provision, Toys R Us gets the testing certificate from BV that does not list 1207. So at that point, Toys R Us effectively has a representation. All the required tests will be done. Here are the tests that were done. That's a representation to Toys R Us that 1207 does not apply to this particular slide. And that's a conclusion that could reasonably be drawn. But, but, and but, if but it's the e case... E even if you're right, 1207 says it has to be designed to, to bear 350 pounds because that is the outer limit of what an adult may weigh who's going down it. Yours says the outer limit is 200 pounds. It, it, it warns that someone 200 pounds or greater should not be using it. Um, but that assumes that you 150 know... pounds less than what 1207 speaks about with regard to a so-called rigid slide, as you say. Sure. And if you looked at that slide and you thought that 1207 applied, then that would be a problem. Here, there was no evidence that Toys R Us believed or knew or was told that 1207 applied. So that can't be but gross you, but negligence. You, but you, I hope, recognize that there are many adults who weigh more than 200 pounds. Uh, certainly, Your Honor, but there, there, there's no evidence that Toys R Us knew that this thing was going to collapse and kill somebody if someone, going more, if someone more than 200 pounds went down it. The mere fact that's, that it's, it's limited to 200 pounds and it has a warning that says don't go on this if you're over 200 pounds, that does not necessarily mean that Toys R Us knew that if someone more than 200 pounds going down it, would, 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 it would collapse and well, kill them. What themselves. would you think would happen? I mean, isn't that what would happen? Um, it, it could be that someone could injure themselves in the water. It could be that someone could, could fall off it. Any number of other things could happen, but there was no evidence that Toys R Us knew that, that someone going down this slide would suffer a collapse. Did, did, um, this... did, 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 did Toys R Us file a motion for a directed verdict as to the question of gross negligence? Uh, Toys R Us filed a motion for a directed verdict as to negligence, staking out a more aggressive position, saying that, look, there's not even negligence here. The court could have ruled on that by saying, no negligence or no gross negligence. And then in post-trial motions, Toys R Us broke them out and said... But, it, but at the close of, of uh, the plaintiff's case, th there was no motion that specifically raised the issue of gross negligence. That's correct, Justice Fina. It just was um, negligence. If this was gross negligence, then every retailer, every part of this country is committing gross negligence every day. This is the way retailers buy these products. Well, Let me turn to punitive well, damages. Well, 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 well
this is a product dangerous enough that there's a safety standard for it established by the Consumer Product Safety Commission, in part because it speaks about the rather extraordinary risks associated with swimming pool slides, which include quadriplegia and paraplegia, resulting from users, primarily adults, using the swimming pool slide for the first time, sliding down the slide in the head first position and striking the bottom of the pool. Yes, that is the risk that that regulation is designed to, to guard against, not the risk that the slide would collapse and the person would hurt themselves. So that is not what happened here. The, 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 the rider here hit her head on the side of the swimming pool. If I could get to punitive damages well, ever so quickly. Well, your time is up, so you're going to have to wrap it up. Sorry. Uh, yes, Chief Justice Ireland. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court has made clear that gross negligence is the least blameworthy conduct that allows punitive damages. It has also said that in some instances, a one-to-one -one ratio is the right ratio of punitive damages. If there was ever a case where that is the right ratio, this is it. And neither this court nor the U.S. Supreme Court has ever approved punitive damages in a ratio greater of one-to-one -one in a gross negligence case. And I would point this car uh, court to the Clark versus Chrysler decision which in reducing punitive damages from about a 7-1 ratio to a 2-to-1 ratio said that the right ratio there would have been 1-to-1, one except that in that circumstance, one, there was knowing conduct by Chrysler. Chrysler knew that its design was faulty and had some problems, and two, the compensatory damages there were not substantial. They were several hundred thousand dollars. Here, the compensatory damages at $2.6 million are certainly substantial. And so therefore, under the Clark decision, if this court were to follow it, a one-to-one -one ratio would be right. And I would also submit that a one-to-one -one ratio is right as a matter of common law, as the U.S. Supreme Court found in the Exxon case. Certainly, reprehensible conduct of a drunken captain in charge of a supertanker, and the U.S. Supreme Court said that as a matter of common law, one-to-one -one ratio was right, and Exxon also common embraced... Law. That was federal common law, well, Justice not, Botsford. That's not our problem, is That's it? correct, but certainly this court can look to that as guidance because it goes back several hundred years looking at the common law and concluding that a one-to-one -one ratio was correct <coughs> even with really reprehensible conduct. And I'd go one further and say that in Exxon, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court embraced Justice Ginsburg's earlier opinion in which she said that if a state high court were to have some handiwork in setting a one-to-one -one ratio, that could hardly be questioned. And so I'd invite this court, as a matter of common law, to adopt that here in this case. Thank, Thank you. you, Chief Justice Ireland and members of the court. May it please the court. Uh, Tom Smith for uh, Michael Elio. Uh, with me is Ben Zimmerman. Um, I think that at the outset, um, I'd like to ask the court not to forget that what happened here was the death of a young woman in front of her husband, a young child, uh, when she came down the slide and the bottom collapsed and her forehead uh, between the collapsed pieces of fabric of the slide struck the pool uh, concrete surface and uh, her body then entered the water um, to be saved. Uh, that, that was indeed tragic. There's no question about that. And the jury considered that fully in awarding substantial damages. I agree. Punitive damages are a separate issue. I understand. I understand. Um, I would like to, if I may, address the issue of 1207 <coughs> briefly. Uh, the, uh, the applicability of 1207 uh, in terms of whether or not the Consumer Product Safety Commission intended that this apply to every slide that meets the definition was not brought to the trial judge's attention. There was an order that the, uh, the Toys R Us uh, state its contention about the applicability of 1207 early on in this case. Toys R Us uh, gave an answer that said that 1207 uh, applied although some parts of it might not be applicable, like the ladder section, um, handhold sections, applied to this slide. That answer is still in effect today. They've never amended it, never changed it, and that was their position throughout that, the trial. That's what I was going to ask. There, that, was there any point in arguing the motion in limine or at any point thereafter where, there, where 
where you would say that uh, Toys R Us said this regulation simply has no application to an inflatable slide? No. In, in fact, that's quite the contrary of what they said, including their testimony by Mr. Dobson, who was one of their experts, who in fact agreed that it did apply. Uh, in addition... With, with these exceptions? Well, he, with, he yeah, also and talked with about the handhold, that. with the... Yeah, and that was fine. They were allowed to present that evidence about what parts did or did not apply. They did not present any evidence that this 350-pound rule did not apply. In addition, the, their 30B6 uh, witness, whose testimony was read, testified, uh, and this is, uh, uh, and that Toys R Us was at all times aware of it and responsible for being aware of that standard. Correct. Answer, correct. Does Toys R Us know what the purpose of this standard for swimming pool slides that we had marked was? Answer, to ensure the safety of the item. Question, to ensure that the safety of the swimming pool si slides that Toys R Us sell. Answer, correct. Toys R Us only sold this inflatable slide ever, and so the only inference was that Toys R Us thought it applied to the uh, slide, to the inflatable slide in question. The uh, reason why waiver is important is because, or the issue of waiver is important is because uh, the trial judge has to have uh, an opportunity, a fair opportunity to rule on this, develop a record uh, on whether or not the, uh, uh, the standard applies or the question of whether the standard applies. And you can actually see the importance of that by the fact that what we've got in this case is reliance by Toys R Us of th some things that are just aren't in the record uh, as, it, as it was developed at trial, this Aviva appeal, another letter from the Consumer Product Safety Commission, um, some other materials that were submitted as part of the appendix uh, that were just not part of the record. And for this reason, uh, the court should not uh, consider that argument. But even well, what if about it, that case your brother refers to? Uh, he says I wrote. I, frankly, I can't recall it, but I... I, I can't. Rodkiss. Rodkiss. I can't uh, recall it either. Um, but I. You I don't think, know about that case. No. Okay. I remember it. I was the trial judge in that case. <laughs> well, that would give you a reason to to have it come back. And, and, and I said th to the defendant that your objection is 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 your rights are preserved. I I I, I and other judges have done the same thing, and thereby preserving an otherwise unpreserved objection for appellate review. That was not done here, and in fact, there wasn't that kind of there wasn't an objection, so there was nothing to preserve. Uh, there was an objection, uh, and one of the points that my brother referred to was there was an objection to the physical marking of the standard as opposed to reading it. And actually, defense counsel said, "Well, I have no objection if you read it, uh, but I'm object to the to the to the standard being marked as an exhibit." Um, and uh, given to the jury, the judge then exercising his discretion decided to mark the standard mm. so that the jury would have their pictures in the standard or drawings in the standard, would have those. Um, so that uh, the importance of uh, the uh, process uh, for um, preserving rights at trial was just not followed here. Um, I would like to turn to, to gross negligence a bit, aside from the fact that there was no motion for a directed verdict on that. Um, if uh, Toys R Us had looked at the product, not only would they have found that it didn't meet the 200 pound, it didn't meet the 350 pound rule, or would have had some suspicion that it didn't. Uh, they would have also realized that there was something on the back of the slide in fine print, not an adequate warning, as the evidence indicated, that said, uh, don't go down head first. And the standard, the 1207, requires that it be safe for going down head first. And the reason for that is that that is a foreseeable use. Even Toys R Us's uh, witness, their 30B6, agreed that was a foreseeable use, as did their experts. Um, so that an examination of the product would have indicated that it didn't meet the 1207 standard. Further, um, but Bureau Judge, did Whitehead said in his opinion, right, that he, he didn't technically did not have to rely on 1207 to get to where he got. Is that fair? I'm, I'm not 
I'm not following what you're, what you're. Well, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, but. There was other evidence of, of, of negligence. I mean, the, the, the behavior of the slide in, on this instance, uh, for example, when it collapsed when somebody got to the bottom, was mimicked by the tests that the defendant done where the dummies collapsed the slide at the bottom. So that's the sort of uh, routine examination one might expect of a seller of a product like this uh, would have also disclosed its defective nature. But... Um, and there was also evidence that it violated ASTM standards uh, is along the way. Um, but what I'm addressing is, is the extent to which um, Toys R Us's conduct here reaches the, the outrageous level. And I think that, that reprehensible. the reprehensible level. Well, I would go to outrageous. I'd go beyond reprehensible. Did the jury find gross negligence or simply did it find one of the alternatives? I've, I've not seen the verdict form. The, the jury was asked and found expressly gross, gross negligence. Um, that was one of the questions, and they found that. And they found that it was also a ca they, the causation uh, question was answered affirmatively as well. Um, Toys R Us had one employee in its safety assurance department who looked at 4,000 of these certificates a month to figure out whether they indicated uh, appropriate compliance with the standards. When these came through, these certificates issued by this Bureau of Veritas, this independent testing lab, they didn't indicate 1207 testing, and they only said on them that they had tested the product to the standards that Toys R Us had requested it be tested to. So that Toys R Us was uh, put on notice that Bureau of Veritas was not certifying compliance with the world of regulations and standards. But, but, but he... But the argument is, I take it, that quite apart from Bureau Veritas, the, the purchase order has a, a, a warranty that they have done all required testing. I think that's what it was said. The, there, the, there is a warranty on something called a master purchase agreement, which was in evidence, <clears throat> which was uh, supposedly entered into by Manley, but Toys R Us, even though it called for a signature, could not produce a signed copy of this agreement. In addition, Toys R Us claimed at trial that they had an agreement with his Bureau of Veritas to do all the required testing, but did not have a, an agreement, a signed agreement with that. And the only person who testified to that was an employee who wasn't there at the time and who, who later led the safety assurance de department and entered into a signed agreement to that effect. Um, in addition, they had a, um, Toys R Us had a, a, a safety program document that was, again, not signed by Manley, who may or may not have manufactured this slide. There's no clear evidence that it did, um, that was not signed, that said that the vendor is going to specify what tests need to be done. So that the idea that's, that, that, that Toys R Us had some reliance on this, uh, on this uh, warranty uh, that all tests were done, that it could take solace in, is, is not correct. Uh, and it's not uh, part of the evidence. Um, if, if you would turn to I the would. punitive damages, yes. are there, or your brother says there has never been a case involving gross negligence that has reached a 7 to 1 ratio. Do you agree? Um, I don't. I, that's gone through the Supreme Court, I, yes, because the Supreme Court has not taken um, a death case, um, except for Oberg, which ruled on a sort of more limited point about um, Oregon's uh, uh, non-review of punitive damages. Uh, but the Supreme Court has not taken a death case where um, the, um, um, where the, 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 the claim was gross negligence and a, and, um, uh, in, a, in a death situation. Uh, what we have for guidance here is, um, in a sense, um, cases from other jurisdictions. There's this Clark case where they, they, uh, there was a two-to-one, uh, as I recall, ratio. Uh, but Clark is a very different case on the degree of reprehensibility. In that case, uh, Clark um, Chrysler 
had not done some testing. The testing was, uh, that, that was claimed to have led to the death. There wasn't clear evidence that the testing, in fact, did lead, the failure to do the testing did lead to the death. And most importantly, what's different is that there was no violation of standard or of law in, in Clark, but a two to one ratio was, was the reduction in that case. Um, and, uh, sorry, a reduction by the appellate court or reduction? By the appellate, by the appellate court. But, I think it's the Sixth, sixth Circuit. Can, can, uh, can, can well, the, remind me, where does this $18 million figure come from? Surely it's not the profits that Toys R Us made from the sale of this. Where does the $18 million the of punitive damages the $18 come million from? $18 million is a product of, of what the jury decided was the amount that would be appropriate to assess as punitive damages based on instructions that were not objected to at the trial. Uh, by Judge Whitehead to the jury about how to assess punitive damages. What are the Which most are, compelling evidentiary points that a jury could have relied upon to reach an $18 million punitive? Well, as I think that the, as we, we uh, have been discussing, the degree of reprehensibility of Toys R Us uh, is a product of, or is, is measured by those factors that are in um, the Gore case. And perhaps the most chief among them are the, the the first two are perhaps the most important. The first one was, is it a physical versus economic harm? Here you have a physical harm uh, versus an economic harm, where, uh, which is the case in almost all of the other cases that have gone through to the Supreme Court that have developed the law on this subject. Um, the second uh, thing, the second uh, item is um, the extent to which the the public's health or safety are being put to risk. Um, and uh, the indifference of the defendant to the health or safety. Again, that is a factor that weighs heavily here. What we've got is a federal safety standard, and industry safety standards being ignored, marketing a product to multiple consumers. I uh, take it there were thousands of these sold. 4,000. 4, by Toys R Us nationally. Okay. And I know there, I, at least I was suggestion there was one other injury case. There was another serious injury, yes. So that's... That that's, was not a Toys R Us. It, they were marketed also by Walmart. Okay. And, okay. So there are tens of thousands. Tens of thousands of them. Correct. Well, what's the evidence here that, um, that Toys R Us, or is there any evidence that they, that they knew um, that this actually did not conform to specific industry standards? At the time of the sale, well, I think uh, I think the evidence is, is can lead to the inference certainly that they had they should have had a high suspicion of it. Did they? Was there somebody who who came from Toys R Us? If you can imagine this, probably not evidence that we could develop that that uh, said uh, we know this did not conform and we put it out uh, specifically. There was not that evidence. That would you, do you agree that that would be m more compelling evidence? If, 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 if that's a compelling factor? Well, you could imagine a lot of other compelling factors that would make the case even better, but it's hard but to is imagine. But is that one? Is that one? That's one. But, you could, but in this context, with this case, it's hard to imagine a corporation marketing a product that had more indicia of dangerousness and defectiveness and violation of law without actually knowing it. We're as close to the line here as I think you can get without... Um, somebody actually getting up and saying, confessing that they knew about it. Uh, Counsel, your time is up. Thank, thank you. Very uh, much. I request that thank the court you. affirm the verdict. Thank you. All right, we'll take a brief recess.